think I have the willies, Brother Dave. I'm not quite sure what to make of that comment that uh, Brother Dave made about the connection between the term willies and the state of Missouri. Um, I happen to be born and raised in the state of Missouri, so I'm not quite sure how to take that. This uh, Hoosier pride is something to of a unique sort, but uh, it's Brother Dave's birthday today, so I've got to be nice to him. Um, you know, I do respect the state of Indiana. Uh, you know, when I when I asked the Lord for a, I said, Lord, you know, I'm eventually going to need a, a good woman beside me. So he, he he answered my prayer. He gave me a woman from the state of Indiana. So there must be something good about this state. One good thing about the renewal, you know, that I always enjoy uh, more than anything, perhaps, is the fellowship that we have uh, that we don't always get to have through the, through the year. Some of the brethren that we see every year is just we see once a year, and I really enjoy uh, the fellowship that we have together. Amen. You know, some people are close enough to God that the activity of the wicked in the, in the earth it bothers them. I know a lot of people that really kind of have a, a who cares, ho hum attitude about uh, things like that. But anybody that has a ho hum attitude just isn't close enough to God to care. Many of the Psalms are written from that perspective. The psalmist, whether it be David or some of the other writers of the Psalms, they were very upset and were and concerned about the activity of the wicked and that they that justice would be done in the earth. And, uh, but sometimes uh, I feel that way, but at other times I feel tempted to, uh, to become discouraged also about uh, the wicked and those who are, uh, are rebellious against the Lord. And I, sometimes I feel like the writer of the 73rd Psalm. <laughs> this is, it wasn't David that wrote this psalm, but, but sometimes I feel like this. Sometimes I feel like the wicked are getting all of the good things and God's people only suffer. Have, have you ever felt that way? Here's what the writer of the 73rd Psalm says. He says, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The wicked are doing good. Does something isn't right here. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence from their callous hearts Come iniquity, the evil conceits of their minds knows no limit. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. It doesn't look right. There are some things now that just simply aren't fair, necessarily. They just simply haven't been made right yet. He continues in verses 11 and 12 of the 73rd Psalm. They say, how can God know? They rebel against God, in other words. Does the Most High have knowledge? They think they're getting away with something. Uh, many, many people of the wicked think, I can do whatever I want without any, without any consequences. I can just live my life however I want. M many people believe that. In verses 13 and 14, the writer says, Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in, in, in innocence. Now, I'm trying to live godly and... And nothing good's happening to me, and here the wicked are just uh, doing whatever they want, and they're prosperous. It's, something isn't right here. All day long I've been plagued, I've been punished every morning. In the 16th verse, he says, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Something isn't right here. Something, something in this world has not been set right. There's, there is not, not everything in this world is just. It's not fair. How many of you young people have had your parents or somebody older say, well, you know, life just isn't fair. Well, that's, sometimes that's the way it is. And this was oppressive to me, the psalmist says, until I entered the sanctuary. Amen. <laughs> until I entered the sanctuary. Things kind of clear up in the presence of God. Amen. And he says, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you've placed them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin, how suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. The wicked have their day now, 
But our day is coming. Amen. Our day is coming. The psalmist goes on. I love the end of this psalm. He says, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Now, there are some things that we just don't understand about justice and about uh, why the wicked aren't punished and why the righteous suffer. There are some things we simply don't understand. But he says, yet I am always with you. You hold me by your right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom, I, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it's good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. The wicked may have their day now, but our day is coming. My, reward, my, uh, my sermon is entitled, His Reward is With Him. And my text is Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Revelation 22, 12. Jesus himself speaks these words. He says, Behold... I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I'll also read verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the beginning and the end. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. His reward is with them. You know, God still makes a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. There is a distinction that is made even in the world today and certainly when the Lord comes again there's going to be a very sharp distinction made uh, to, that's an understatement of course between the righteous and the wicked I think God has built if you'll allow me maybe to philosophize a little bit about this I think God has built into the world the concept of a reward for our deeds this is a concept that's, that's even present in the world. Even We kind of expect that. It's just kind of built into this natural order and this, this system that's in the world. You do something, you get a return. If you, if you work at your job, you expect a return from that. If you don't get paid, you get upset <laughs> because it's kind of worked into this world order. The, the concept of deeds and reward. Works and reward is built in. It's also, I think, a part of our sense of justice that's built into the divine image that man still bears. This has already been said, I think, by some other brethren, but even though uh, we're marred by sin, we still bear the image of God. And the scripture says God is just. He is just. And I think our sense of justice is derived from that image of God that is still, that is still present in man, that we also have a sense, even though sometimes our sense of justice is warped, by sin, not everything is just as I was saying before. But because man still bears the image of God, we have this sense of justice that some works deserve something like this, some works deserve something like that. It's a sense of justice that's still present in, in the image of God in man, even in unredeemed man. We all seem to sense that a day of justice is coming when good works will be rewarded and wicked deeds punished. I think that in some ways, in, in a limited sense, even unconverted, even people who are not of the family of God in the earth, they kind of, in some ways, have a sense of this. They may not tell you that. They may not admit that. But this sense of the end, this sense of final justice, I think is built in and woven into our uh, natures. We kind of sense this. God has put eternity in the hearts of men, Solomon said. We have not experienced the final reward and judgment yet. It hasn't come yet. It's only going to come when Christ comes. And as I said before, some things are not fair in this life. Good works often go unnoticed and unrewarded in this world. And evil deeds often go unpunished. Just look at the state of affairs in our own government right now. It looks like sometimes people get away with things in this life. And in many ways, they do. Our reward is not in this life. Christ has a reward for his people, but that reward will be given in its fullness only when Jesus returns and not before. He is bringing a reward with him when he returns. I love this. He calls it 
his reward. Did you catch that in the text? He says it's his reward. My reward is with me. And he says, and I will give it. Christ personally, in the flesh, in person, if you will, is going to hand out this reward when he comes again to his people. Yes, he is also going to bring judgment for the wicked. The wicked are going to get what they deserve at last. When Christ comes again, there's going to be justice on the judgment day. But the righteous are also going to get what they deserved. And that's kind of the aspect of this truth that I want to develop. There are two sides of this coin in some ways. That there's judgment talk in this text. In Revelation 22, 12, he says, my reward is with me. But then he says, I'll give to every man according to his deeds. That's uh, judgment talk. That's like what Paul said uh, to the Corinthians. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to, to give an account of deeds done in the body, whether they're good or whether they're bad. That's judgment talk. But uh, the, the top side of this coin that I want to discuss is the reward that Christ is bringing for his people. That's, that's what I want to focus upon today. The reward for the righteous. I want, to, I want to look at three aspects of this truth. First of all, his reward is earned. Secondly, his reward is exclusive. And thirdly, his reward is eternal. So first of all, his reward is earned. Now, obviously, before I get into this text, I want to clarify something, perhaps a little disclaimer. I'm not saying that we earn our salvation in any sense. This reward I'm talking about, folk, is, is an inside view. This, this reward I'm talking about that Christ is going to bring, this is for people, this is for people that are already in. This, is, this reward I'm talking about is, is not held out to people who are not already in the household of faith. And so I'm certainly, when I say that his reward is earned, it's, it's not that we're working towards our salvation necessarily. And I, I, I want to clarify and develop uh, some of those things. I just wanted you to be aware of that. His reward is earned. His reward, I think, is earned by our works. And I think the Bible does teach this. Again, I'm not saying that we, we earn our salvation. A reward is given to you because of something you did. That's just the nature of a reward. It can't be called a reward otherwise. Otherwise, it's not a reward. It's a gift. If something is given to you and you didn't do anything to earn it, that's a gift. Now, salvation is called a gift of the grace of God. But, but the reward I'm talking about is not quite on the same level as that. Salvation was the gift of grace. But you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which will bring a reward. They will. Make no mistake about it. And Scripture teaches that. If Christ will judge wicked works, he will remember and reward good works. Now, the problem here comes with the fact that non-believers can still do some good works. I mean, we, we have to be honest about this. Even, even non-Christian non people, people that are not born again, that do not claim the name of Christ, who are living in sin, it is still possible for those type of people to do good works. I mean, that's pretty obvious. A lot of the uh, good works that are done as far as social activism in our nation today are done a lot of times by non-Christian people. They do good works. But the sin of unbelief will negate any good works a person may have done. And the faith of a believer will validate any good works done in the name of Christ. And remember, faith without works is dead. It's not real faith, as James said. Now in this world, in this world, you can be a scoundrel and get good works. That's true. As far as things are right now, you can be a scoundrel and still get good works for it. Or you can do good works and get persecuted for it in this world. That's the way it is. Just the facts of life, so to speak. Now take Judas for an instance, for an example. The scripture said, you know, Judas, he betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And the scripture says he got a reward for his wickedness. He got a reward for. For his wickedness. That is possible, you know, in, in this present evil world. Uh, it's, it's not just. See, our sense of justice is thrown off sometimes by things like that. But that is, that is possible. Uh, just, by the way, kind of a little footnote to that. To all of our brethren who may say that once you have the reward, you can't lose the reward. What do you do with Judas? 
the ex-apostle Judas. Just something that you might think about. Now, on the other hand, if you can do, you can do good works and be persecuted for it. Now, in the days of his flesh, think about this, nobody did more good works than Jesus. Amen. It says in the book of Acts, he went around doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. And what happened to Jesus? Well, they crucified him. One time Jesus said, for what good work do you stone me when the Jews picked up stones to stone him? See, it, it doesn't make sense sometimes in this world. Our sense of justice is thrown, is thrown off. I'll say more about that in, in a minute. Christ will judge people for their works. He will. You and I are going to be judged for our works. That even, even a converted person, at some point, folk, your works had to change. You, you had to do what Scripture says, repent. <laughs> Turn around from the evil works you may have been involved in before, and you had to, you had to stop, your works had to change. And Christ is going to judge people for their works. The righteous and the wicked will be separated one from another on the basis of their works or lack of. And this is spoken of in Matthew chapter 25. And I want to refer to this passage now. The righteous and the wicked separated on the basis of their works or their lack of works. Matthew chapter 25, a familiar passage to most of you. Starting with verse 31, then the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? Prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry. See, here's the works. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick. You looked after me. I was in prison. You came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? Then when do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I'll tell you the truth, whatever you did. See, I'm emphasizing your, your works here. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers, that's an important word of this text. Christ is talking about how you treat his brothers, which refers to, to believers, I, I take it, the church, Christian people. These brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are, you who are accursed. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. See, there's a lack of works. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do, whatever you did not do, your lack of works, for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did not do for me, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That illustrates, see, my point that I'm making. We're judged by our, Christ will judge people for their works. The righteous and the wicked will be separated on the basis of works that are done. There are many other texts, I suppose, that I could go to to refer to that. But uh, for a lack of time, that should be sufficient. His reward is earned. His reward is earned by our effort. Your effort is involved in obtaining this. See, this reward is obtained, folk. It's, that's, the, that's the word. It's obtained. It's not something that Christ just dumps in your lap uh, apart from your, your effort. You obtain this reward. It is not locked in or automatic. It is not. Christ will empower your effort, but you must do what is required to get the prize. Now, Paul, compare, he actually compares this to an athletic competition. And you know some of these texts. Hebrews 12, 1 says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run. See, that's something you have to do. Christ is not going to run for you. Run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. Paul said in another place, run in such a way as to get the prize. 
Your effort's involved. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. See, that's, that sounds like effort on your part to me. They do it for a crown that will not last, referring to the athletes in the world. We do it for a crown that will last forever. Amen. You know, it is sad to me that many times people of the world work harder for their temporal things than Christians work for eternal things. What's even more disturbing to me is that many of the, the people that are involved in false religions actually serve their religion more zealously than many professed Christians serve Christ. Something's not right with that picture. Paul says we go into strict training to get a crown that will last forever. Amen. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Paul again, one thing I do, this is what I do, I forget what is behind, I strain for what is ahead. Amen. Christians are, are future focused. <laughs> We are. We, we don't, don't waste your time looking back, looking behind to your past. He says we look ahead to what is ahead. And we strain for it, Paul says. I strain towards it. That's effort that is involved on your part. You, you're the one that's going to have to do that. Amen. I press on toward the goal to win the prize of the high calling of God. Paul again to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. You're going to have to do that. Amen. You're going to have to fight. Lay hold on eternal life. That includes your effort. You're going to have to do that. Christ offers it to you, folks. Make no mistake about it. See, God's in God's grace, He's offering this to you. That's grace. But uh, you're, by your faith and your effort, you, take, you lay hold of this reward. That's how, it's, that's how it works. See, a believer who is spiritually lazy cannot expect to get the reward any more than a lazy athlete can expect to win in his sport. Amen. We have an adversary who will take our reward from us if possible. Do not forget, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Actually, what kind of reward would it be if you didn't do anything to get it? See, it can't be termed, a re it's not a reward at that point. Like I said before, it's a gift. If somebody gives something to you and you didn't do anything to earn it, it's not, it can't be called a reward. It could be called a gift or a present or whatever, but not a reward. So what kind of reward would this be if, if you weren't involved? That's what I'm saying. If you're not involved in this thing, what kind of reward would it be? It wouldn't mean very much, I don't think. This reward is earned, I think, also by our suffering. By our suffering. Now, do you actually think Christ would let his people suffer for his name and not reward them? If we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. Christ is not going to forget the trouble that you and I have to endure while we are in this world. And all of our afflictions, all of our troubles... All of our suffering will bring a reward, not just persecution. Amen. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving or working for us an eternal glory Amen. that far outweighs them all. If you put suffering on a scale and glory on a scale, you put suffering that you might have to endure and this reward that Christ is offering to you, if you put it on a scale, the reward is going to outweigh any, any suffering. Amen that you and I might have to go through in order to get this reward. Now, Jesus knows how you feel. Jesus knows how you feel because the scripture says that he endured the cross for the joy or reward set before him. So Christ knows exactly how you feel when you suffer. Now, how could we endure trials and tribulations if we did not know about a reward? How could you endure when you're in the midst of an affliction, in the midst of persecution, in the, in the fire of suffering and pain in this world, if you didn't know about this reward, if you didn't have this sight and this vision, this goal, this prize ahead of you, how could you endure? How could you? Maybe, just maybe, People drop out of the church in times of trouble so often because this reward's not held out to them enough. 
It's just a theory. Now, we don't all suffer the same things or even the same amount, but the scripture does say we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Persecution also will not be forgotten by Christ. Make no mistake about it. Amen. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Amen. Persecution is not going to be forgotten. What about those holy martyrs? What about them? The martyrs, the people who died, were killed for no other reason than the fact that they belonged to Christ. You think Christ is going to forget about them? No, sir. He is not. John, in the book of Revelation, he saw those holy martyrs under the altar, he says. It's, it's in Revelation 6 and verse 9. And they, see, they had this same feeling of justice, this, this unequal justice. They had this even after death. Before Christ came, they, they cried out and they said, How long, O Lord, till you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? See, this same... This same uh, unequal justice in the world even affected these martyrs after they were martyred before Christ came. Persecution is going to be remembered. Those who die for their faith have a great reward coming. Amen. Now persecution, folk, could come here just by way of application this morning. This is always possible. Persecution could come here and it, it does disturb me. In our culture, in our land, when I see a growing animosity toward Christians, this is, this is something that's going to happen. I, I don't know what it is. I don't claim to be some sort of, of prophet that can prophesy the future or anything, but, but something's going on, folk, in our land. I don't sure, I'm not sure where it's going to go, when it's going to take place, but if you read the signs of the times in our culture, there is a growing animosity toward the church. And toward Christians, toward people who don't compromise. See, our culture, the only thing that they, don't, that they don't like is people who won't compromise. See, the only thing they won't put up with is people that won't compromise. And uh, there's, something, there's something coming. And I ask you this morning, if you didn't know you had a reward, how could you die for your faith? How could you do that? I think of the, those four Hebrew children, as the Negro spiritual says, that... They, they, they went into the fiery furnace. They told King Nebuchadnezzar. But if not, I, see, they, they had to have known that they had some sort of reward on the other side. I don't think they could have just gone through that just because they had to. How could you die? Some of us here may have to die for our faith. I don't know what the future holds. Are you, are you going to be able to do that? I'm saying you won't be able to do that unless you have this reward firmly in grasp. And in your sight, you will not be able to lay down your life any other way. Hebrews chapter 10 speaks about a persecution that may come and how Christians are to react. And he connects this with the second coming. Hebrews chapter 10. You know that all of you are familiar with this passage. Hebrews 10, 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. See, that's a person who knows that they have a reward. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. Don't give up in the face of trial and suffering and persecution. Your confidence will be rewarded by Christ. Secondly, my second point here this morning, his reward is exclusive. His reward is exclusive. I'm talking about the reward he has for his people. Uniquely, exclusively for his people. The wicked will be rewarded with hell. That's going to be their reward, if you want to call it that. Now, most of the time... It, 
And the way we use the word reward, that has a, a positive connotation to it. We, the other side would be punishment. The, like the opposite of a reward would be punishment. So the wicked are going to be rewarded with punishment, with, with hell, the lake of fire. Not everybody is going to be saved, folk. No matter what, the one brother was preaching yesterday about uh, Brother Wallace, about some of these uh, scholars that we, so-called scholars, that we have in the church today. And one big doctrine that is, that is prevalent in a lot of uh, denominational churches is universalism, in case you didn't know that. This idea that somehow everybody's going to be saved. God just loves everybody the same. It's, it's not true. It is a lie. Some people are going to be thrown in the lake of fire. Some people's works... The end, see, the end of your works is one of two places. Your works have an end. It's either going to be a reward from Christ or it's going to be the lake of fire. Amen. Make no mistake about that. The wicked will be rewarded, if you can call it that, with hell. But Christ has a, war, a reward exclusively for his people, a special reward for his people. This reward is for his servants. This reward is for people who served him in this life. Maybe at great personal expense, they served Christ in this life. You see, in the kingdom of God, there's a high priority placed on servants. People who serve Christ are the ones who are going to get the reward. Even Jesus, as Brother Seth so eloquently put it in his message, Jesus was a servant. He served. And if you want a reward from Christ, you're going to have to serve like Christ. Amen. Servants. His reward is exclusively for his servants. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, Jesus said. Matthew 20, 26. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. I like that. Of all. That's Mark 9, 35. If you serve Christ here, you will have a reward there Amen. because you served. Now, some people object to us uh, talking about a reward in, in, for our service. Some people object to that. They say that we should just serve Christ anyway just because he's Christ. And I think they mean well when they say this. Uh, I think it's just ignorance, though. They say that we should just serve Christ without expecting a reward. Now, I will hand them this. They are right in one respect. We should not serve Christ and always expect a reward in this life. You should not do that. You'll be disappointed if you do. Our reward is not in this life. We don't expect a reward from Christ in this life when we serve him. But Jesus did say there will be a reward for his servants when he comes again. And I am going to serve Christ in order to get that reward. And you should too. Amen. I do serve Christ and expect a reward, but it will be given there, not here. It's not in this life. If we are faithful servants in little things here, we'll have a great reward there. Well done, my good servant, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. That's quite a reward, isn't it? Ten cities. I'm not sure all the extent of the world to come. But have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought that in this life, you can determine your involvement in the world to come? Have you ever thought about that? The extent of your involvement in the world to come, you can determine why you're in this world and in this life. Actually, folk, the real stuff is in the world to come. <laughs> It, the real stuff begins there. It doesn't begin here. You're, a, you're over small things here. Small things. I like Brother Kenny Smith. He says, it seems like I'm just busy. I got so many things here. But Jesus says, you're just in charge of small things. It's, he, it's because he's making a comparison. We, he can say that because Christ is looking ahead to the reward. He's looking ahead to the world to come. And in comparison to what you will have on the other side, no matter what you have here, it's small. It's a small thing. This is one reason why I really dislike this health and wealth doctrine that somehow has become extremely popular in the church in our day. This teaching that if you serve Christ in this life that you'll be rich and that you'll have an expensive house and car and he'll bless you 
in material things. And, and it's all a lie. It really is. Because uh, this, see, this pins people to the earth. If, if, it is, if it is taught that you can get a reward in this life for what, how you serve Christ, it immediately focuses everybody's attention in this world. And that, that is deadly to, the, to faith. Amen. Because our reward is in that world. You, you need to be focused on the reward in that world. And if you're blessed in this world, that's fine. It's a stewardship. Amen. But uh, this, this health and wealth talk is, is not good for the body of Christ. So just a question to throw out that, that I'm not necessarily going to answer in maybe to all of your satisfaction. Will our rewards all be the same? This is maybe a point of, of, of uh, maybe disagreement among some, some people at this point. I'm not sure I can answer this totally. How I do have a theory. I don't think our rewards are going to be the same. Because in that parable that I referred to where the, the good servant was given ten cities, there was another servant only given five. And there was one guy who was judged <laughs> because he was not a good servant of Christ. So I do not think that all our rewards will be the same in the world to come because not all of us have been entrusted with the same thing in this life. If you try to please men, you will have no reward from Christ. You will not. If you focus now, obviously, if you please God, you'll please God's people. But if you focus your attention on pleasing men, you will you will erase your reward from God. You will have no reward from God. I want to refer to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter six. Jesus talked about this very thing. Pleasing men will negate your reward. Matthew 6, verses 1 through 6. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from my Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And I take it that reward's coming when Christ comes, that he, re he will reward you. Jesus picks up this refrain again in, in verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Because they're trying to please men. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Amen. There is way too much men pleasing going on in the church today. Amen. You knew that was coming. There are too many... Leaders, Christian leaders, preachers, too many Bible college faculty, staff, and presidents, too many church members who are trying to please men and are not concerned about pleasing God. You will not have a reward. They have al there are people, you know, who have already had their reward in full. Do you realize that? We need to be more concerned about what Jesus thinks of us because he's the one giving the reward. Amen. The ultimate reward. Some people already have theirs. I don't want that to include me. His reward is exclusive. It is. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Amen. Now we are so religious today, but do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? Only those who hunger and thirst will be filled. Amen. That's what Jesus said. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. Amen. Amen. So just read that the other way. If you don't hunger and thirst, you won't be filled. Amen. Now, I'm not filled yet. I'm not. I, I hunger and thirst for righteousness. But uh, to be perfectly honest with you, and you probably experience this too, we're never really quite filled in this life. We really, we may have times like at the Refreshing Waters Renewal where we go home and we think, man, I've just been, I've just been filled and edified all week. And you probably have been. But really, 
you haven't been totally filled. When Jesus said they shall be filled, that's a future thing that will happen when his reward comes with him. His reward is going to fill him, fill us. Only those who seek will find. Amen. Only those who knock will the door be opened. Now, a lot of people in the church, folk today, they want a religion, but they do not want Christ or what Christ has to offer. There's a big difference. Amen. Yeah, Brother Given mentioned these seeker services, you know. Well, I've read a lot about that from, from my classes at school. And as far as I'm concerned, most of these seeker services are designed for people who are seeking some type of a religion or an institution or a form of religion. They're not necessarily designed for people who are seeking God. It shouldn't be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. There's nothing necessarily wrong with seeker services in and of themselves as long as you've got people who are really seeking Christ and not just a religious institution or a form of religion. We are supposed to seek God and to seek Christ and not to, be, not to offend any of you, brethren, but I love all of you who are my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I'm not seeking you. <laughs> I'm seeking Christ. You're not going to reward me. Christ is going to reward me. Now, here's an interesting aspect of this. Even things that seem small in this life will be rewarded by Christ. Amen. Even things that we would think that are insignificant and small and, and don't really make any difference, those things are still going to be re rewarded by Christ. Th this might minister, I, I thought, to some of you ladies more, perhaps, than any of the rest of us. This aspect of truth. But here's what Jesus said. Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. That's, that's, Brother Seth mentioned, uh, you know, about lo loaning people his lawnmower in his message. We shouldn't, you know, get, get all upset about loaning somebody our lawnmower because we have better things in heaven. And that, that small thing about lending to somebody who really essentially is your enemy, if you do that, it seems like a small thing, doesn't it? But Christ said your reward will be great because you did that. See, what the world calls small may not be small at all, Amen. as far as Christ is concerned. That's in Luke 6.35. Then your reward will be great. Let me look at Matthew chapter 10. Jesus talks about another seemingly insignificant thing that's going to bring a reward. Matthew chapter 10, verses 41 through 42. Anyone who receives a prophet... Because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man, because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. A cup of cold water to a disciple. Your service to Christ is significant to Christ. Amen. Personally. Jesus personally notices the things that you do in his name. And no matter how small the world may think it is. See, some of you ladies probably may think, well, I can't preach, I can't do this, I can't do that. Even some of you gentlemen who perhaps don't, don't have the abilities or the desire to lead a congregation in preaching think, ah, what, you know, what do I do? What, what can I do? I'm nobody. I haven't been to Bible college. I haven't been to seminary. I'm just a nobody. Well, you're not just a nobody. Because even the little things that the world doesn't even notice, Christ notices. And he's going to reward those little things that you do. Just the, just the, the, uh, the Christian gift of hospitality that Paul writes. He always writes to the Christian and says, be hospitable with one another. Why do, you think he, why do you think he writes that? Because Christ notices those things. There'll be a reward for that. Some of you ladies who've been cooking all week for us and, and uh, that those of you who have served to get this building ready, don't think for a minute that, that Christ didn't notice that. He did. He noticed that. And it may be small to the world, and it's not going to be printed in the newspaper tomorrow, you know, that, that uh, Sister So-and-So cooked a meal at the First Christian Church. The world doesn't notice, but Christ, he notices. Amen. I think there are more preachers that need to think about 1 Corinthians 3, 15, 14 through 15. This is an interesting passage that many Christian leaders, church leaders, and preachers and teachers in the, in the church probably need to think about this text more. Paul says, If what he has built 
survives, he'll receive a reward. If it's burned up, he'll suffer loss. Now what Paul's talking about, if you read the context of this passage, Paul's talking about the fact that he's a builder and he's adding to God's church converts. And he makes the application to, to preachers and leaders in the church. He says, be careful how you build. Amen. What kind of converts are we winning anyway? See, preachers and teachers, myself included, if you win converts, true converts, kind of interesting what people call converts today, you know. If you really win people to Christ, if they last till the, through the fire of judgment, you'll get a reward for that. If they don't last through the fire of judgment, you'll lose that reward that you could have had. That's what Paul actually says. So I think a lot of preachers and teachers don't really think about that text. What kind of converts are we winning? People who will finish or people who will fail? If they finish, preachers and teachers, if you're people who, whom God has given you charge over in the church, if, if you preach to them and you convert them, if, if they finish this race and enter into glory, you'll get a reward for that. If they, if they don't make it, you won't get a reward for that. You'll lose a reward that you could have had for your work. Sometimes it seems when I preach, I preach for nothing in return. Brother Dave, do you ever feel that way? You just you, you preach, you preach, you work, you work, nothing happens. You preach, you preach, nobody listens. You preach, you preach, your church doesn't grow. You, you work and you preach for nothing. But that isn't actually the case. I often, when I get to feeling that way, I, I often think about those Old Testament preachers, or we call them prophets. You think you have a hard ministry. <laughs> I think about the prophet Ezekiel, or some of those other, Jeremiah, or some of those other holy prophets of the, of the Old Testament days. They felt that way too. Did you know that? Some, several of the Old Testament prophets, in, in their times when they preached and they were rejected, they felt that way too. Here's what Isaiah said. I, I was uh, edified by this. Here's what Isaiah said about his ministry. He says, I've labored to no purpose. You ever felt that way? I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yeah, preachers, teachers, you ever said that before? Here's what Isaiah says, though. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. And my reward is with my God. Amen. Don't expect, preachers, teachers, don't expect to be rewarded when you preach. You, you may have some converts. You may have a, you may, church may grow. But uh, your reward is with God. Your, real, your true reward. There have been a lot of holy men and women in the past, especially under the old covenant, who served God but had no reward in this life. They're going to be rewarded too with you. Did you know that? Just think of Moses. It says he, dis, he regarded disgrace for Christ. Christ hadn't even been born yet. He regarded disgrace for Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Amen. How are you going to be able to make it through this world and not get caught up in this world order and in this materialism that's, that's so prevalent here in our land? You better have your eyes on the reward. Moses did. He forsook the treasures of Egypt, which at that time, that was the greatest empire on the face of the earth, just like America might be today. He, he, he said, I, just, I don't care about that because he was looking ahead to his reward that he had from God. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, some, another text about these holy men and women of the past who served God in this life, but really didn't get a reward for it. They're going to be rewarded. That's, that's my point. That even, even those people back there with us are going to be rewarded. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 13 through 16. It says, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. In this life, that is. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, 
They would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they are longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city. He has prepared a city for them. Aaron already asked this question in his message, and I'd already prepared to ask it too, but is God ashamed to be called your God? Are you looking ahead to your reward? Are you looking ahead to that city? If you are, God's not ashamed to be called your God because he's prepared a city for you. He's prepared a reward for you. And together with us, they're made perfect. The scripture says those Old Testament saints together with us, are they made perfect? This just illustrates. Brothers and sisters, that nobody can serve Christ or serve God and not be rewarded for it. I like Revelation eleven eighteen 18 says the time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets. That time's going to come when the Lord Jesus comes again. Our reward is not in this life. I want to emphasize that our reward is not in this life. Psalm 17, 14 has this phrase, men of this world whose reward is in this life. And that is not a compliment in that text. For the wicked, this is the best they will ever have. For the righteous, this is the worst we will ever have. So just be nice to the wicked now, because that's the best they're ever going to get, see? That's why Jesus said, love your enemies. <laughs> just love your enemies now, because that's the best they're going to get. Because when Jesus comes again, they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire. So just love them now, be nice to them now. This is the worst we will ever have to endure. See, we have something to look forward to. This is our hope. You know, uh, Romans chapter 8, I won't turn to it. Romans chapter 8, 24 through 25 says, Hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But we wait for it patiently. This is our hope, our reward uh, from Christ. My third point this morning, his reward is eternal. His reward is eternal. The things of this life are temporal. I won't spend a lot of time on this. It's already been emphasized by Brother Given and others. This, the, any reward that you may get in this life is still temporal, even if it came from God. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Do not store up treasures here. Store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. That's why we're told in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, Do not love the world or anything in the world because this world's passing away but Christ's reward is eternal Amen. it will not pass away now this reward can be described in two words eternal life there are many ways to describe it. I'm going to go through some of them here eternal life that's an aspect of this reward and this is what he has promised us even eternal life 1 John 2.25 in Romans chapter 2 and verse 6 Paul talks about people who, who seek eternal life. I want to read this passage for you. Romans 2 and verse 6. God will give to each person according to what he has done. That, doesn't that sound like our text in Revelation 22? To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Amen. He's going to do that. Now, what is eternal life? Well, Jesus said it in uh, John 17, 3. He says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, in the world to come, we will know God fully there. We will see him face to face, the scripture says. See, to know God is eternal life, but you can't claim that in this world, as Brother Kenny Smith ministered to us last night. You can't claim that you know God fully in this world. But we're going to get that promise of eternal life. That promise that they will know God. That's going to come when his reward comes with him. When Jesus comes again. We're going to see God face to face there in the world to come. Now we see through a glass darkly. Then we shall see face to face. That's an aspect of this reward. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the sea. His servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There's not going to be anything in the world to come to distract you from the Lord. Amen. To distract you from God. All of your service will be offered to God. It'll be perfect service, as Brother Kenny said last night. 
His name will be on your foreheads. You won't think about anything else except the Lord, except serving God. That, that's a reward worth looking for. Amen. You see, actually, God is our reward. Amen. Christ is our reward. God told Abraham, I am your very great and exceeding reward. Amen. I am. And those who seek God by faith, like Abraham did, God will also be your reward. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God, because whoever comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. If you seek God, your reward will be God. Amen. He is our reward. We have an inheritance in heaven. Peter said it's uncorruptible and undefiled. That can't be said of any reward in this life. 1 Peter chapter 1. It says you have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It can't perish, it can't spoil, it can't fade. Kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That's when Jesus comes again. This inheritance, you're going to get it. When Christ comes again. It's already there. The inheritance is already there. It's kept in heaven. It can't perish, spoil, or fade. And when Jesus comes again, that reward, that inheritance, that's just another way of looking at the reward. You can call it a reward. Call it an inheritance. It's going to be yours when Christ comes again. Paul said, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You are a co-heir with Christ. That means you're going to inherit everything Christ inherited. What did Jesus inherit? Inherit everything. <laughs> He's heir of all things, Hebrews chapter 1. And you're a co-heir with him. So you have a very large inheritance waiting for you on the other side. I want to be able to say with Paul at the end of my life or at the coming of Christ, whichever comes first, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I want to be able to say that when Jesus comes again. This is the crown, no doubt, that we will cast before the throne. When we see him. You know we're finally going to get to rest. In the world to come. You can get to take your armor off. The scripture says blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes says the spirit. They will rest from their labor. For their deeds will follow them. That's part of your reward. Amen. There remains a Sabbath rest. For the people of God. We don't have it yet, but we were, are going to receive it when he comes with his reward. We're going to receive the kingdom at last. Now, you have the kingdom now, in, in, in a sense. You're in it now, in a sense. But when Christ comes again, you're going to have it. You're going to receive the kingdom. This was prophesied in Daniel chapter 7. It says, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. The time came, verse 22 of Daniel 7, the time came when they possessed the kingdom. That's going to happen. You're going to get that kingdom. We're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Amen. As uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 10 indicates, the world to come has been made subject to us. That's, right. That's what that text says there. I, I think Brother Dave might have referred to that text in his message. That the world to come has not been subjected to, to angels. Maybe it was Brother Michael in his message. The world to come has not been subjected to angels. What is man that you're mindful of? Son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. Now crowned with glory and honor. Says, but we don't see everything made subject to him yet. But we see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels. Now crowned with glory and honor. Because he suffered death. That by, the, by his death he might taste death for every man. The world to come has been made subject to us. When Christ comes again, part of that reward is that world to come is subject to you. Amen. 
Even, think about this, even our resurrection bodies will be a type of a reward. It's like, you get a resurrection body, it's like Christ is going to say, you know that vile body that you had, that you had to put up with this whole life? You know that vile body you had that you had to keep in subjection your whole life? Well, here's a new body. It's kind of, that's part of our reward, you know. Amen. In conclusion, we have a small glimpse of our reward now by faith. We can taste of the powers of the world to come. Amen. All the things we experience now in Christ are the first fruits of our redemption. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. The joy and the love and the fellowship with the saints and the good word of God and everything else we experience is all but a small glimpse of this reward that is up ahead when Jesus comes. I've got to be honest with you, not everything about this reward is known. There are some aspects of this that we still won't know until the Lord comes again. We know just enough to whet our appetites Amen. and to keep us in the race. You see, this reward is our motivation to endure. You have this reward out in front of you. That's your motivation, your incentive, if you will, to keep running the race and to endure and to persevere. There's a song that I've liked in the past that I like to, that I like to sing. And here's the words to that song. It says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his sweet face all sorrow will erase. So daily run the race till we see Christ. Now some people say it'll be reward enough just for me just to see him. You know, and in a sense that's true. I understand that. And some people say that they would be satisfied, you know, just having a little shack in the corner of glory. But I'm not satisfied just with those things. I'm not. I'm not going to be satisfied with just a little shack in the corner of glory. And I want to see Christ, but there's even more to it than that, folk. As Brother Dave ministered, seeing Christ is going to be an indescribable event. But Jesus said, I'm coming and my reward's with me. He's bringing something with him. Not only is he coming... His reward is with him. And I'm not going to be satisfied with anything less than what Christ is going to bring. Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me.